Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and the man who I often wish I could fire off into orbit, it's Dave Vitti. Hello. Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Now with Dave. Big morning, how are you? It, it is a very, very big day for us today. You know, so much so, Jason, that we haven't even got time for our normal, you know, daily chitter chat. Blather. Because we're, we're, yeah, blather. We're on a tight schedule, right? T minus 30. We yes. need to prepare for launch because we have got limited time with <laughs> today's guest. Mate, you're firing on all 10, aren't you, today? <laughs> so our guest today is a gentleman who, well, we've been trying to get him on the podcast for what seems like light years. Mm. Essentially because we've just got loads of questions for the yeah. man. He's an author, and wait for this, he's an astronaut. A real astronaut. A real astronaut, which means in my book, he's a real spaceman. It is, of course, the one and only Major Tim Peake. Tim, how are you? Good morning, I'm really well. Yeah, good to see you both. Hey, mate, I've just got this story, which I've got to get off my mm. chest, because I've told everyone about this, and everyone's raised an eye going, oh, yeah, really, JP? Well, we first met at Silverson, the British Grand Prix, about four or five years ago, up in a hospitality towards the end of the day, after the Grand Prix, at a major drinks brand. And I was having a chat with, <laughs> with, 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 with Tim, and obviously, you know, bombarded him with the questions. And then guess what happened next? A chap came up to have a chat with Tim, and what do you think he did, Dave? I don't know. Job. Was he was he a, was he a, a publicist or was nope. he a, an agent? Or? No, he was another astronaut. <laughs> right. So that's that's two astronauts. He was an American chap. Do you remember this, Tim? Yeah, that was that was Drew Foistel. Yeah, a good friend of mine. Unbelievable. No, I've told so many people about that, and they all raise an eyebrow and go, "Oh yeah, all right then, JP. Please, please confirm that." <laughs> yeah, no, Drew um, was in between missions and we, we knew each other from training over in Houston. He's a lovely bloke and uh, he was actually getting ready for his second mission and he was he's a huge Formula One fan yeah, yeah. and had some friends who worked at that major drinks company that you mentioned. <laughs> uh, and so we'd, we'd been yeah. touring around the factory, we'd been driving the simulator uh, and enjoying a day at Silverstone. Wow. Amazing. I love amazing. that. I love that. Um, as I say, thank you so much for joining us today, Tim. Uh, genuinely, so many questions to ask you. Um, a lot of those are about the book and then about space and then more stuff about the book, etc. So let, let's get into the book first and foremost. It's entitled Space, a Human Story. Uh, my question for you is, do you think that this will answer most of Jason's extensive list of remedial <laughs> questions? And therefore, should I perhaps buy him for Christmas? Oh, nice. I, I certainly hope it will give a flavour <laughs> of the kind of inside story of some of the, the things that go on in the space industry. Mm. It is that human element, isn't it? It's, it's about what we've been doing since the early days of the space race, right up until, you know, my friends and colleagues who are right now training to go back to the moon. It kind of, kind of covers all, all of that. But mm. we just didn't have enough room to put in every story of the 628 people who have flown to space. But I think I've got a flavour of the best ones. My Lord, only 628. That's incredible. Mm. Incredible number. Mm. Low, uh, yeah. I mean. Yeah. So look, yeah. here's a question. I'm off on running now. So the, the no gravity thing. How does that work? I mean, have you got to be strapped down all the time or anchored up or, or do you just float around? Most of the time you, you float around when you want to. If you want to do any tasks with your hands, the problem is that you need to anchor your feet before mm. you can work with your hands and you can't be holding on to things all the time. So we are constantly um, using our feet kind of underneath handrails. We're gr gripping with our feet, if you like, okay. like monkeys. And what's really strange is after six months in space, the soles of your feet are completely um, clean and fresh like baby's feet. You just don't put any weight or pressure on them. But the top of your feet are horrible and scaly yeah. and hard yeah. skin because you're constantly sliding your feet underneath these handrails to, to stabilize your body position. So, yeah, we, we have to always find a stable position before you can use your hands. So if you were just floating and you pushed into into the air, w would you get a reaction to go backwards? Is it? Or, or... Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you can. It's um, you can actually kind of spin yourself around just by using your body, the momentum of your body, with rapid movements of your arms or legs and kicking. It's a bit like kind of swimming in space, mm. swimming in weightlessness. Right. You only ever really need to do that if you get completely stuck in the middle of a, of a middle of a module, <laughs> and you can either shout for somebody to come and rescue you, or you can start swimming around and moving your body until you can reach a handrail <laughs> and, wow. and get yourself back. That's why with spacecraft we don't 
actually want them to be too big. Um, yeah. There's no point. You could just get stuck. Ah, you, you always want to be able to reach out and grab a handrail. So, so when you talk about these these rails, presumably, I'm imagining underneath your desk or wherever you're sat. A little bit like, um, you know, in pubs, with the way that they would used to have the rail that you, you know, you could put your feet on. Do you remember? You yes, used to have like yeah. a sort of rail there. I guess you've got one of those that you just sort of tuck your, tuck your toes into. Absolutely, yeah. There's rails, rails everywhere. Yeah. You're always kind of tucking your feet under. Yeah. Um, and outside on a spacewalk, we have foot plates mm. so that we can actually put our spacesuit boots into these foot plates and anchor right. ourselves. There. Uh-huh. And then you can be driven around on a, the end of a robotic arm, for example. Uh, I mean, that's the most crazy thing is when when your crewmate inside is driving you around on a robotic arm <laughs> and you're in this foot plate out on the space station. You have to have a lot of faith that they're not going to bang you into something how funny by the way for those that are watching the video version of this it does look a little bit like we are talking to you from space but actually you are in a sort of bbc broom cupboard uh, you know talking to us now and we know that because just (laughs) just before this 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 links into my next question is that one of your one of your assistants brought you (laughs) a coffee halfway through so for those that thought you were in deep space suddenly this sort of costa coffee arrived but i wanted to i wanted to continue the food and drink theme Um, um, again, you know, it's all these basic things that it sounds childish, I, I grant you, but these are all the things that, that ordinary people like us think about. It's like, where do you go to the toilet? What do you eat? I mean, what do you eat in, in space? Do they have microwaves? How is stuff heated up? How does it work? Yeah, we don't have a microwave. We have a, an electric food warmer, which okay. is a bit like, uh, I guess, a, a toaster. And you, you can kind of put these foil pouches in, which is just like camping food, stuff that's irradiated and then comes yeah. up. So, it's, you know, if you're going to fly food to space... Like it's army have, rations, I guess, as it's well. It's just like yeah. army rations, yeah. yeah. It's got to have a long shelf life. Uh, it's got to be lightweight packaging. It's got to be robust to withstand the G-forces of launch. Um, all that kind of minimal packaging, mm. all these things. But it's then also got to have the minerals and nutrients and vitamins that you need and the calories. Mm. And probably the last thing they think about is the taste. Um, right. that's, perhaps, <laughs> as perhaps a bit, uh, as perhaps a bit unfair. But yeah. Um, yeah. what they do is they actually lower the salt content because mm. salt exacerbates our bone density loss. So oh, their right. food ends up being a little bit bland right, and a little yeah. bit tasteless occasionally. So it's getting better, but mm. uh, it's not the best. Yeah, well, I've, I've heard that the higher you go, the more salt you need to make the taste. Because apparently on Concord, their di- dishes when, when when God bless it when he's flying around were loaded with salt just to balance it up. Oh, really? To yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently Yeah, so. the ho- it's, it's interesting, different vibes. And what was interesting with you, like Concorde and, and airliners, they tend to operate at lower pressure, maybe mm. about the same pressure you could get about 7,000 feet, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and in, in space, we actually operate at one atmosphere. So it's exactly the same pressure as we have yeah, right man. now. But you're right about the smell because but there, no air is rising. We don't get convection because you've not got any gravity. Um, there's no difference in hot air versus cold air in terms of uh, rising and falling so this without this convective heating mm. you know here on earth you get a nice hot plate of food and it, all that smell is coming yeah. up your nose and that gives you so much of your taste and we don't yeah. get that in space mm. at all I, I could speak all day about Me space too. questions Me but obviously you're into speed you're into power it kind of in an intergalactic way mm. but but when you're on earth you know what 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 what's your car passion what drives that bikes cars what is it uh so i my cars i'm afraid they're pretty boring and practical so i get my fun from bikes um and okay. uh, i like i like off-road biking actually but um i've been riding quite a few triumph motorbikes recently and um anything from the street triple which is just a crazy bike yeah, yeah. um but a lot of fun um through to the big sort of tiger 1200s uh, which i love um no i'd love to love to i, I do enjoy um driving as well i've had a couple of track days um down at goodwood which is very close to where i live mm. yeah. and um you know being able to jump in and out of these supercars it's been it's yeah, such yeah. a such fun but it's such a privilege to be able to do that and I remember uh, taking the McLaren 720 round the track and the instructor I was with said you know there's only one corner I'm going to ask you to lift slightly otherwise it's either full throttle or full brake and he said when I when I say full brake I mean full body right. weight on the yeah. brake you know yeah. you, you stamp 
and it was just blistering. I mean, we were going some crazy speed down the back straight, and, and this 90 degree corner is coming up. And I was thinking, can we break now? Can we break now? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, hold it, hold it. Uh, so, yeah, I do like speed. I do like cars and bikes. Does that ring true then for you, Jason, in terms of Goodwood? Can you do, is it, is it, a, is it a track of extremes with full on and full uh, off? Yeah, do you know what? There's some. I mean, that you know, you're talking about the 720s. I mean, by any shadow of any imagination, mm. that is a rocket ship. That car. Yeah. But in anything, I mean, I've raced around, around there lots in old classics. You know, there's a mixture of corners there, some slow, tricky stuff. But by God, there's some fast corners. Yeah. But it's old school. There's no runoff. There's no gravel traps. You yeah. go off, you're going to hit something very hard. So yeah. it's a great circuit, and I'm sure. I mean, you know, that instructor who sat next to you, he's a braver man than I would ever oh. be. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I, mean? I know. Hats off. Um, yeah. I actually, I actually took the M5 off the track uh, on the one of the corners. It was, uh, I can't remember the name of the corner, but it was one of the corners, about the only corner you can just yeah. get away with it. And we got back oh. on the track. But I, oh god, yeah, that was a <laughs> nightmare. I thought, am I just about to write off? an m5 now um I, I just i just got out the m3 and i didn't really fully appreciate the extra weight as we were mm. going mm. into the corner and left the braking a bit fast but I, I do i take my hat off to those instructors because they just get you to push you um to the the absolute limit and it's your limit of course it's not the car's limit the car course, can do yeah. so much it's it's your personal limit i couldn't um, do it i mean i used to do it long long time time ago like 30 years ago I used to instruct i just haven't got the bottle for it now I just enjoy, yeah. I just can't I can't sit next to people even no. professional drivers I hate it do you know what I mean I think that's an age thing though isn't it don't you just become more intolerant as you get older uh, yeah well I, well, it's when I think actually I mean I, I was shouting at myself in the mirror this morning <laughs> as a flying instructor I used to love taking up new pilots um, mm. but it's the same thing it's kind of that, that you're almost challenging yourself yeah. as to when how late you can leave it before you do need to just jump on the controls and stop yeah, the yeah, aircraft yeah. from crashing and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'd have the same amount of patience and tolerance today as I did back then no I don't I don't think my nerves could handle it to be honest with you not that I'm, I'm equipped to actually instruct on either but I don't think that mentally I'm the right person um, Tim let's go back to to the early days if we can uh, passing your test is obviously a huge rite of passage we always say it's a huge part of everybody's life certainly for me it was the thing that I wanted to do more than anything else far more important than anything I did or didn't do at school. Can you remember passing your test and indeed what was your first car? Oh, I completely remember passing my test, yes. Um, uh, I was, yeah, thankfully passed it first time. And I just, I did love driving. I loved the technical mm. side of it. I loved understanding how an engine worked, um, you know, gearbox and clutch and all the rest of it. And that, that, those first experiences of driving. And then I went and got myself a mini Clubman estate. Uh, nice. I think I think it was about 350 quid, yeah. um, but it was beige with the wooden strip down the mm. side. I tell yeah. you what, it'd be, a, it'd be worth a lot more than 350 yeah. quid now. Yes, it wouldn't yeah. be just. And the two barn doors opening at the back. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and I was working in a pub. I was a barman at the time. And I remember one day my boss, we, we ran out of Guinness and he said, you've got to go to the brewery and, and pick up a couple of <laughs> barrels of Guinness. So I drove there and I, I loaded two barrels of Guinness into the back of the clubman. And, and that was the end of the suspension. I mean, it just wrecked, <laughs> wrecked the car. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I had to sit on a I had to sit on a cushion after that because I couldn't afford to repair the car. <laughs> so I just sat on a cushion because the suspension was absolutely trashed. The hearing aid beige mini bit the dust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so what came after the mini? After the mini, I had a Fiat, which my grandma gave to me. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I was at Sandhurst. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I was doing some long trips because my sister was up at Keele University. And right. so at the, at the weekend, I'd go and see her and we'd go to these university parties. So I'd bring kind of my Sandhurst mates with me and we'd go to student union parties and then drive back. So I ended up doing a lot of mileage in that, that mm -hmm. little uh -huh. Fiat. Um, and then um, after that, I was posted off to Northern Ireland with the Royal Green Jackets. And, uh, and that's when I got my first car that I fell in love with. And that was a BMW 320 Motorsport. Nice. Absolutely loved, loved that car. Um, a, drifting, had... a drifting Supremo ran roundabouts. Oh, if I yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, I ended up going backwards on the um, M27 in that um, and ended up in the central reservation. <laughs> no way. <laughs> so that was, I was a young, young pilot in training. And um, 
uh, the, the the tires should probably have been replaced about six months earlier than they were. They were a little bit flat and, and aquaplaned at night one time driving driving back. Um, and thankfully, there was no other traffic on the road. But uh, that gave me a real shock. That was yeah. the first time I'd actually kind of been in a in a car accident. And uh, I think when you're young and um, fearless, you think that you're absolutely invincible. Mm, and, yeah. and something like that kind of wakes you up to reality. I'm not sure that's just for young people, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's also weird the fact that I find that in any kind of situation like that, you know, I've I've been lucky. I've not had any major crashes in my time, but I have had a, had a couple. It all happens in slow motion, I always think. Yeah. Don't you think yeah. it's weird? When you, when you look back to something, the whole process, which must have been fractions of a second, mm. just seemed to have been a bit like, you know, almost like a film. It's a bit like, whoa, we're going to hit him any time now. It's very, very strange. But it's, I think that actually gives you extra time to make your decision. I, mm. I remember, I could have span a couple of times, I remember seeing that bridge twice through the windshield as, as, as spinning around. And then, and then having the kind of presence of mind as you're going backwards to really think about how to, how to move over to the center of reservation mm. while still going quite fast and actually use it to slow down and get out the way of, of any traffic coming. And, I, and again, it happened in a fraction of a second, really. But I think that that whole thing just allows your brain to operate in, in a heightened sense of awareness. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, that's what ra ra racing cars is like. Mm. I can imagine, because it's, you know, you're in the moment, but I would imagine if someone was sat next to you, everything would be going at a million miles an hour. But somehow you just slow it all down. Mm. And mm. very occasionally you do feel that happen. And you have all the time in the world, say on the brakes at 150 miles an hour to go down four or five gears. But it doesn't happen all the time. It would be lush yeah. if it did. <laughs> I'm sure it does for Lewis Hamilton and, and, and Max and Stafford. I'm sure they're going at a very slow pace in their heads. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tim, you were saying before about um, obviously your, you know, you get your thrills from your bikes and that your your day to day drive is is fairly um, family orientated and not that exciting. Is there a motoring itch? that you would one day like to scratch? Is there something in there you think, do you know what, one of these days, that's that's the thing for me? Oh dear. Um, I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to take uh, the old Aston, you know, DB5 out round the track, something mm. like that. Um, I haven't actually driven any classic sports cars properly, so I think that for me would, you know, be fantastic fun because it's it's so much raw. I've, um, in fact, just this week the Gazelle helicopter went out of service with the British Army, and I flew that aircraft for many years, over a thousand hours, and it's just like, you know, it's the, it's like the E type of the uh, of the yeah. sports car world. Yeah. You've got this low seated position with your legs out in front of you, a slight smell of engine oil in the cockpit, and everything's really raw. There is no autopilot. No, no stability control system or anything. Mm. It's just you and the stick and the and the elements. And and I think that's probably what you you get from a classic car. Yeah, it's a fantastic looking helicopter. That isn't it with the exposed engine on the back. It's a proper proper thing, isn't it? It is a proper aircraft, yeah, yeah, and it's properly fun to fly as well. I mean, it, it belies its manoeuvrability, actually. It's really a very agile, fast helicopter, and, yeah. and, and, and you can do you know, loops and rolls in that thing. It's, it's manoeuvrable. Can you really? Um, absolutely, yeah. But uh, wow. it's all like an old car as well. It'll bite you if you get it wrong. Mm. Well, we talk, talking of old cars, I can definitely get you in something which I drive a lot of, and it scares the living daylights out of me, so it'll be fine for you. It's, a, it's an old big block um, Chevrolet Cor Cor Corvette St Stingray, oh, wow. which I race wow. at Goodwood. Yeah. So, we'll, yeah, off, off air, we'll sort that out. Sounds great, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> oh, genuinely, I was just thinking that before, as you say, when you were talking about racing old stuff, and I kind of thought, well, I know what the uh, I know the way in for that, Jason. I mean, you yeah, two well. should uh, <laughs> you should you should partner up, and actually, we you two at Goodwood in something old and crazy that could be fantastic. That'll be it? a lot of fun. A lot of right. fun. We'll sort that out. Hey, topic. Uh, of conversation on our TVs all the time nowadays is electric vehicles. What's your thoughts on that? Fancy one? Would you have you? Um, oh, I'm, I'm driving a, a Ford Mach E at the moment okay. um, and really enjoying it. Mm. Uh, right. I mean, they are, yeah, it's, uh, they're really, uh, I think it r r tells you how much noise pollution we have in our lives because they're just so much quieter. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously you get a much greater torque and you can have fun with that acceleration. Um, so yeah, I've been really uh, pleasantly surprised as, as how much fun they are to drive. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think it is the, the way ahead. I think it is, it is the future. So something we're all gonna probably embrace at some point. 
Absolutely. You know, as I say, it's something that we, we, we do and we sort of feel we have to ask all of our guests, really, because it's such a big topic, isn't it, Jace? I mean, Christ, you know, you do, a, you do a TV show all about electric vehicles, so you're the man at the cutting edge. Funny enough, we do. And you know what? I, I didn't like them at all. And mm. you know why? Because I've never spent time with, with yeah. them. And once you actually, you know, get rid of the prejudice, because I come from a V8, V10, you know, noisy petrol world... Once you actually spend a bit of time with, with, with them, like the noise you mentioned, Tim, it's a completely different experience. And, and actually, it's it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it is. Um, it is really nice. And uh, it's, I think the technology's moved on now mm. to the point where, um, you know, you're getting very good range out of these vehicles we're getting more infrastructure for charging it's less of of, of that anxiety of oh my god <laughs> when am i gonna run out and where can i recharge and i think once we get over those those kind of hurdles um and once you know the cost uh, of the second hand uh, market starts bringing yeah. the cost of vehicles down then it's going to be something that you know is going to be much more accessible to everybody yeah. i think so i definitely think so so here's um i'm just mindful that we are rapidly approaching the end when we need to let you go major tim a couple more questions from myself and jp the first one is this and this is quite a tricky one i always think of all the cars you've ever owned in your time you need to pick one and one only and stick with it for the rest of your life. Which one is it and why? Oh, um, it would have to be the, the 320 Motorsport oh. um, because I ended up after that accident um, and thankfully it was just a bit of bodywork. I mm. ended up having the engine um, overhauled and it was just back to in fact it was better than it had ever been i had yeah. this uh, this mechanic who was just absolutely passionate about um uh, about rebuilding cars and um and i was a young uh, army pilot at the time nothing else to spend my money on so i mm. thought well let's spend it on getting my engine rebuilt <laughs> and, <laughs> and that car afterwards was just a, it was a delight to drive i just had so much fun in it so I, yeah that uh, had the beautiful alloy wheels lower mm. suspension <laughs> i mean it was it just it was the bees knees. it was brilliant it was fantastic hey mate don't call them accidents it's just a shunt it's a <laughs> shunt <laughs> a little shunt yes. yeah a wee little shunt because that could conjure up anything in your mind could, could, couldn't it? <laughs> so look here, here's a great question for you we, we always believe that music and cars go particularly well together so Fa a fantasy drive where are you where are you going what are you listening to but most importantly if you could pick any car in the world what are you driving oh right so um i would be uh when i lived in houston we used to love doing kind of big camping trips uh up to the northwest it was mm -hmm. like Wy wyoming montana utah idaho all those lovely areas yeah. so i'd probably be driving uh along the Grand Teton you know that valley with the Grand Tetons mm -hmm. uh, uh, on, on the left hand side and you've yeah. just got these big open fields and uh, bison roaming around so I'd be I'd be blasting down uh, that, that that valley there um, listening to Guns N' Roses Sweet Child of Mine uh, <laughs> and like uh, what would I be driving um, uh, I mean I, I, actually on those roads you'd probably want to be in some big pickup truck because yeah. that's, yeah, you know, yeah. that, that's what you need to be yeah. driving in, in in the states so yeah i'd be in some big massive ford pickup truck or something I with a it. with a v8 it. in obviously a big yeah, yeah the, the yeah. big v8 absolutely. yeah yeah and we're not we're not going for electric are we on the way to wyoming or somewhere like that we want a exactly. massive great big growling uh v8 tim before we let you go just quickly uh news obviously this week did i read somewhere that you are coming mm. out of retirement well, we assigned a memorandum of understanding. There's an, a company called Axiom Space, a U US company that mm -hmm. uh, runs commercially sponsored missions. And the UK Space Agency is having conversations with them, looking at an all UK mission to space, yeah. which would be really exciting. Mm. Um, so I am helping the UK Space Agency and Axiom with that mission. We haven't assigned a crew yet, mm -hmm. and there are several steps before that mission <laughs> becomes a reality, but we could be looking for you know a crew of four to go and fly to space. And yeah. uh, if the opportunity comes, along then i'll make myself available uh, <laughs> i can drive most things how hard can it be <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, I, I know how to hook my legs under bar yeah. under bar bar rails. You don't even need to, you don't even need to corner very well. It's just straight line speed. <laughs> yeah, and I can I can throw my arms around to reorientate myself. I'm your mantis, <laughs> Jason. I think I think I think we have just volunteered, haven't we? I think for you and me in space. And I think on that note, you need to take us out or take us into orbit, maybe. Well, let, let's go. Mm. Let's uh, let's fire the rockets up. Well, unfortunately, that is it for this week's Fueling Round, powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car your bike your home or maybe even your rocket mm, mm. Dave Absolutely. as always a big thanks to you but a huge thanks to our special guest this week the one and only Major Tim Peak. it's been Tim. great talking to you both thank you very much Tim it's been great don't forget the book is out now from all good retailers and even some of the bad ones and is entitled Space a Human Story perhaps buy it for a loved one in the season of Goodwill Jason as always you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plato or at David Vitti and if you like what you've heard feel free to give us a five star rating press the follow button and share the podcast on all your socials uh, thanks for listening guys and girls and well we'll catch you next time round the other side of the moon <laughs>